Well, howdy guys, and welcome to our Good Friday experience. Uh, this one's a little less upbeat because uh, we need to realize how bad we are and what we did to Christ to really celebrate Easter. So thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in to Real Faith today. We have a treat for you. We're going, we're throwing it back all the way to 06, all the way to uh, present on Good Fridays. We're going to show seven different Good Friday sermons over the next seven hours. So you can tune in all day if you want to realize how bad you are and that you killed Jesus. Um, and uh, on a little bit brighter of a note, if you text Easter, we'll shoot you guys some resources and a link uh, to partner with Real Faith and we'll send you a Good Friday documentary that's never been seen before that'll help you and your family dive in deeper. We'll send you the live book that has a little bit more good news in it. And we'll uh, enter you guys to win a giveaway, but we don't need to talk about a giveaway on Good Friday. So, but partner with us, encourage you guys, be at home, be with your family, watch this service, maybe take communion together, pray. It is a somber night um, because we killed Jesus. So uh, now I'm gonna throw it to Pastor Mark and uh, he's gonna tell you about it. Been praying for you all week. I was up very early uh, with a lot of tears praying for you this morning. And I feel like I need to pray for you right now. Father God, we say that this is your house. And Lord, we thank you for this house. We pray against the enemy, his servants, their works and effects. And we say in Jesus' name, the Lord rebuke you. We pray against the spirit of fear. We pray against the spirit of confusion. We pray against the spirit of belief, unbelief. And Lord, we invite the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you come and illuminate the scriptures which you have written? Would you, would you teach us who you are and what you are doing and what you have intended for your people? God, as we look at the world, we have so little hope. God, as we look through your word at our world today, God, would you please send us the Holy Spirit, the spirit of hope? And Lord God, I just thank you in advance for those who are going to be saved. And Jesus, I thank you that you said that you came to seek and save the lost. And I know you're gonna do that today. So I just wanna in faith thank you in advance. God, I pray for a particular and special anointing on your word today, on me as your son and servant, and on these dear precious people as your flock and your children. In Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna open the word of God. And before I do, uh, what I'm gonna share with you is uh, something I've never really taught or known at this depth until this week. And I've been doing this for 30 years. And what I'm gonna share with you, some of you will just immediately uh, dismiss. I want you to suspend your unbelief momentarily. For some of you will have skepticism. I want God to help you overcome that. And for those of you who already believe these things, I rejoice in that. Um, we're gonna talk about the war behind the wars. We're gonna talk about not just what we see in the seen realm, but what's going on in the unseen realm. We're gonna open the word of God and not just look at it, but we're gonna look through it. We're gonna understand really what is going on cosmically throughout all of history. That being said, we're also gonna look at the cross of Jesus Christ. I had a conversation recently with a man, a brilliant scholar, PhD, uh, noted author, uh, cultural commentator. I've read some of his books and listened to many of his podcasts. And he was in town visiting and he was doing a large event and uh, he asked if he could swing by the church and say hi. I, I didn't know him, but I knew about him and he wanted to come visit, which was a great honor. So right here in the back of the room recently, he came and I waited to meet him and greet him. And he's written some books about what's going on in our world, how social cultural Marxism is overtaking Western history. It's leading to the mutilation and destruction of whole generations of children and how we are a culture in decline and collapse with arrogance and pride thinking otherwise. He's a brilliant, insightful scholar and he takes ancient ideas and he shows how they can be traced from one nation to the next nation, from one generation to the next generation. And we were talking and discussing and I asked him, I said, well, what do you think about Satan and demons and God and angels? And he said, I'm, I, I'm not a Christian. And my immediate thought was not yet. <laughs> um, and he, uh, he said, I, 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 he was an atheist. I said, well, how do you explain different ideas from one nation and generation to the next causing the same destruction? I said, that to me sounds like a series of what the Bible calls lies. And uh, I said, suspend your unbelief for a moment. This is my summary of our conversation. And I said, uh, if Satan and demons were real, would that explain why certain lies are prominent and prevalent from one generation to the next? 
because though people come and go, the demons remain the same. And even though we have new days, we're dealing with old demons. And he looked at me, he said, if Satan and demons are real, that explains human history. I said, well, just take that home and think about it. <laughs> That's what we're going to talk about. No matter how many tears we shed, how many wars we wage, how many elections we hold, how many degrees we confer, or how many prescriptions we prescribe, it seems like the world is just dark and getting darker and evil is always winning. The question is why? Here's the storyline of the Bible. And if you don't believe it, just suspend your unbelief for a moment and consider this. Something has gone terribly wrong in this world. That means that the solution is not in this world. The world is the problem, not the solution. The solution for this world must come from another world, or as I will say, another realm. In addition, everyone sees the problems, but only the Bible shows or reveals the big problem behind all the little problems. We're gonna talk about that. And to understand our world, we must first open his word and we must look through his word at our world. We're gonna start with the war behind the wars. Ephesians 6 verse 12 says this, we do not wrestle. And that's a word regarding conflict and battle that leads to exhaustion. And many of you are feeling that right now, exhausted, worn out, weary. It's because we live in a world in which we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers. These are demonic divine beings, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness. And it feels like we are living in the period of history that is a spiritual eclipse. Every day is a little darker against the spiritual forces of evil, of evil in the heavenly places. Let me establish for you the worldview of the Bible, and that is that there are two realms that form one reality. There is the seen realm of the physical, there is the unseen realm of the spiritual. And the Bible says that these two realms form one reality. They interact with and impact one another. This is completely contrary and contradictory to what is told in our culture. One of the lies in our world is that we only have a physical world, we don't have a spiritual world. All we have is the seen realm, not the unseen realm. And ultimately, this is a tremendous and deceiving, powerful lie. And the Bible says that in addition to what we see, there is a realm that God sees and he can ultimately reveal to us. These two realms are connected. And let me say this as well, what happens in the spiritual affects what happens in the natural and the converse or inverse is true. That sometimes the conflicts we see in our world, they originated in another realm, in the unseen realm. And until there is resolution in the unseen realm, there will not be resolution in the seen realm. In addition, you need to know that you are not just a physical being. You are also a spiritual being. In addition to your body, God has given you a soul. Not only do you live in this realm, your soul is to be connected to the unseen realm. And ultimately, we see these two realms collide, perhaps most notably historically at the cross of Jesus Christ, where there was a cosmic battle in the unseen realm that manifested itself in the seen realm and the broken body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're gonna talk about the war behind all the wars. We're gonna talk about the problem behind all the problems. And we're gonna talk about the enemy behind all the enemies. I'm gonna start in the book of Revelation, which is the end of the Bible. Then we're gonna to go to the book of Genesis, which is the beginning of the Bible. We're going to establish the storyline of the Bible, and then we're gonna examine your life and place within that story. Let me deal with the first war. And the first war was the war for heaven, the unseen realm. Revelation 12, seven through nine. Now war arose in heaven. This is in the presence of God and the holy angels. Michael, only one of two named angels in the Bible along with Gabriel and his angels fighting against the dragon, that is Satan. You notice that God doesn't fight Satan because they're not peers. And the dragon and his angels fought back. Those are fallen demonic beings in the unseen realm, but he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. This is the first war and this is ultimately the war for heaven. Here we're introduced to a character, his name here is Satan, the dragon, the devil and the deceiver. God created divine beings in the unseen realm as he created human beings in the seen realm. 
Like, like us, they learn, they grow, they make choices, and they're responsible for them. In this instance, there was a, a rebellion, a coup attempt, a revolt against God that ultimately one of the created beings, an angel, angel means minister and messenger. They're supposed to be servants and spokesmen for God. He determines that he instead should be God. He doesn't want to be under the throne of Jesus. He wants to sit on the throne of Jesus. He doesn't wanna be dependent on God. He wants to live independent of God. He does not wanna take orders. He wants to give orders. He doesn't wanna give glory. He wants to receive glory. To say it in another way, he has pride. We now devote an entire month to his honor. We encourage entire generations to follow in his pride. The result was that some of the angels joined with him. Jesus says that they were a third of the heavenly host and that they were defeated and they were cast down because there was no room for them in God's presence. The good news is that the holy angels won the war for heaven. And then the war came to the earth. We'll move from Revelation to Genesis. Here's what we read in Genesis. Before I begin, let me just summarize Genesis one and two for those of you who don't know the storyline of the Bible. The Bible begins in the beginning, God. Everything begins with God, it doesn't begin with you. You're not the most important thing. You're not the most important person. You're not the center, it's not all about you and you're not the hero. In the beginning, God. If you don't begin with God, you don't understand anyone or anything else. We need less self-esteem and more God awareness. So the way the Bible begins, in the beginning, God, God created. So God is creator, not created. Everyone and everything else is created by the creator God who is eternal and without beginning or end. God created the world in which we lived. Uh, God created uh, the stars in the sky. He created the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea. And then he made man and woman in his image and likeness. And God said that everything was blessed and very good. It was perfect. It was idyllic. It's the world that we all long for, but none of us can return to. And then everything was perfect when God was finished. And then the war in heaven became the war for earth. Here's the story of Genesis three. Now the serpent, the one who was cast down, he has now arrived on earth. He was crafty. He had plans and marketing degrees and pollsters and pundits and salesmen. He understood algorithms and he got a degree in journalism. <laughs> he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? That's not what God said. God said you can eat of any tree with one exception. He's trying to show that God is not gracious. God is very gracious. And the woman said to the serpent, she shouldn't be speaking to him and neither should you be speaking to the devil. Some of you, he's been whispering in your ear and you've been having the conversation, it's time to stop. We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it. God never said that. Problems happen when we add to God's word. Your traditions, your legalisms, your preferences, your religious hopes, dreams, and fears, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. God's lying to you. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. You don't need to have a God, you can be a God. The story continues tragically. So the woman, took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her passive, silent, cowardly husband who was with her saying and doing nothing because he got a degree in women's studies and he ate. <laughs> then the eyes of both were opened and they made themselves loincloths. Now they're hiding from each other and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. Now they're hiding from each other in God. But the Lord God called to the Man, we'll get to this in Romans because he is the head and firstly responsible. The woman sinned first, but the man is firstly responsible and said to him, where are you? Same question for many of you men, where are you? The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring or seed, that's speaking here about Jesus Christ. What's curious is all the other genealogies in the Bible, they denote a father. Here it does not because Jesus would not have an earthly father. He would have a heavenly father and an earthly mother. 
between your offspring or seed and her offspring, and he, that is Jesus, the forthcoming son who is the dragon slayer, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Here it says that the war for earth was lost, but Jesus was coming to bring a victory. This is called the Proto-Evangelion. It means first gospel. God is the first one to tell us that though the angels won the war in heaven, human beings lost the war for earth, Jesus was coming and he was going to bring victory. A couple of things I just wanna say briefly. Number one, Satan and angels recruited, uh, excuse me, say it again. Satan recruited angels in heaven and he's still recruiting people on earth. In heaven, he only got a third. On earth, he's got a lot more than that. Number two, Satan shows up uninvited. You, don't have, you have to seek God, you don't have to seek Satan. Satan will just show up uninvited. Number three, Satan wants you to walk away from God and walk with him. Some of you have been doing that. Number four, Satan lies that God is holding out something better for you. It's a lie. Number five, if a man won't lead a family, Satan will. You men need to know that. If you don't lead your family, Satan will. In addition, Satan didn't even show up until they were married. After the wedding comes the war. That's why some of you are having battles for your marriage and family. Number six, we all have our forbidden fruit. Each of us is, ha we have something that is a tremendous temptation and struggle for us. Number seven, Satan and demons want to remove and replace God everywhere on earth. When Satan wanted the throne in heaven and he lost it, he came to the earth, he's trying to take every throne. He wants to rule media, government, entertainment, education, and the church. Lastly, this world cannot fix this problem because this world is the problem. We have now joined Satan in his war against God. We are now enemies of God. The Bible says that we are by nature children of wrath. We're not good people, we're bad people. We're so bad that we think we're good. And so here we are told that Jesus is coming and that he is the dragon slayer and he is the savior. In addition to the war for heaven and the war for earth, there was a war for your life. The apostle Paul in Romans five, he looks back at Genesis three and he provides a commentary of what was happening, not just in the seen, but the unseen realm. We'll read that now. Romans 5, 12 through 21. Here is the war for your life in mind. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, who is that? Adam. And death through sin, the wage for sin is death. So death spread to all men, we all die because all sinned, we're all sinners. You don't have a good heart, you're not a good person. You're not gonna stand before God and have him be pleased with you. Death reigned from Adam, who was a type. That means he is a portrait of the coming of Jesus, of the one who was to come. But the free gift, that is salvation, is not like the trespass, that is the original sin. For if many died through one man's trespass, Adam's decision brought death to the race. Much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. For the judgment following one trespass, one sin brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. He continues, for if because of one man's trespass, Adam, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Note the comparison and contrast between Adam and Jesus, who 1 Corinthians 15 also calls the last Adam. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so the act of righteousness leads to justification in life. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, Jesus, the many will be made righteous. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through exclusively solely Jesus Christ, our Lord. Here's what he is saying is that looking back at Adam, there was a war for earth and there was a war for you. And he's saying that Adam lost that war, but that Jesus came and won that war. Let me explain these two things in succession. And first, let me preface by saying that there are two powerful and pervasive lies that are taught in our culture. Number one, that you're only a physical being, that you're not spiritual. 
You don't have a soul. In fact, there's something called the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. It is considered the quote unquote Bible for mental health disorders. It mentions the soul zero times. We're trying to treat people who have mental, spiritual, emotional pain, perhaps even trauma, and we don't even acknowledge that there is a God or that they have a soul or that the Holy Spirit could even potentially be part of the healing process. Number two, the other pervasive and powerful lie that is told is that you are exclusively an individual. You're not. You're part of the human race and Adam's decision infected and affected all of us. This is the doctrine of federal headship. It comes from the Latin word for covenant. A covenant means a specific relationship over which there is a head and the head of that covenant makes decisions that affect everyone in the covenant. In the new covenant of salvation, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And so he makes decisions for all of his people. In a company, this is where a CEO makes decisions and all the employees are affected. In a nation, a president makes decisions and all the citizens are affected. In a family, a father makes decisions and all the members of the family are affected. And what he's saying is that when Adam chose sin and to side with Satan in the war against God, he brought the whole human family with him. Adam literally means mankind. If you go to the old Hebrew, literally where we read mankind in our translation, the original word is Adam. He is the father of all humanity. And though Adam was not the first to sin, he was held firstly responsible. In the story, Eve sinned, then Adam. But God shows up and says, Adam, where are you? Because he was the head. You men need to know. The question is not, are you the head? But the question is, are you doing your job as the head? Adam failed. The result is that his sin was transmitted or imputed to all of us in two ways, nature and choice. We are by nature sinners. How many of you have raised a child? You didn't need to teach them to lie or to steal or to be selfish. That's part of their nature. That's why we need a new nature. That's why you're not born in relationship with God. You need to be born again in relationship with God. In addition to our sin nature, we are sinners by choice. We all choose to sin. With our words and our deeds and our motives and our intentions, we sin all the time. And what this is, is this is the original sin and it's the loss of the first war on earth. Original sin explains the problem under all our problems, why situations are constantly frustrating. Systems and institutions keep failing because they are created and then maintained by sinners. This is why if you live long enough, you eventually become frustrated with everything from your bank to the government because everything is created by a sinner and is run by a sinner. And as a result, nothing ever works. In addition, original sin explains why history is not evolving. There is a pervasive and powerful progressive myth on the left that we are good and getting better. And we're not. We murder the unborn, we rack up national debt, cartels run our Southern border, liars run government, we all know that leaders are crooked and that politicians are liars. We're not good in getting better. We're bad in getting worse.
The result is death. The wage for sin is death. That's what Paul tells us in Romans. Death comes in three ways. It is spiritual. Our soul is dead, does not love Jesus. We don't know Jesus. We don't love Jesus. We don't serve Jesus. We don't open the Bible with humility and understanding. We don't presume and assume that if God says something and we disagree with it, we're wrong and he's right and we need to repent and change our mind. We're spiritually dead. We live spiritually dead and then we die a physical death. The reason that people die is because of sin against the living God. Death comes to those who sin against the living God. And we live in a world that is just foolish because it thinks only about physical death and not about spiritual death. And it doesn't think ultimately about eternal death. That's the third kind of death. Spiritual death during your life, physical death at the end of your life, eternal death, hell separated from the presence of God, only experiencing the wrath of God. It's so silly. A few years ago, we shut down the planet so that no one would die. Let me just tell you what's going to happen. All those people are going to die. And the question is, will they experience eternal death? Will they experience the grace of God or the wrath of God? Will they be in heaven or hell? Well, what he says in Romans five is, the war that was lost for your life in Adam was won in Jesus Christ. And throughout Jesus' life, he had many battles with Satan. There were many wars, temptations. Jesus successfully waged war against the enemy every single time. When tempted, he said no. When lied to, he quoted the truth, truth of the scriptures. That Jesus lived a perfect sinless life, that he passed every test and he won every war. And then came the greatest war of his whole life, his crucifixion. And the cross of Jesus Christ is the greatest intersection of the seen and the unseen realms in the history of planet Earth. There was not just a war in the seen realm, there was a war in the unseen realm. There weren't just people there, but powers, principalities, and spirits. What was happening at the cross involved both realms. And so what we know according to the story of the Bible and what Paul is intimating at the cross of Jesus is that Jesus died so that we could live. See, what happened with Adam Adam failed and brought death, so Jesus would succeed and overturn death and bring life. Let me tell you a little bit about the crucifixion of Jesus. Heading up to his uh, crucifixion, Jesus was aware of what crucifixion would entail. He saw it in the course of his life, and it's always state-sponsored terror. Crucifixion started as impaling by the Persians in roughly 800 BC. They would take a long pole, they would sharpen the edge, they would then run it through a man's midsection, they would drop the pole into a hole, and a man would be flailing and impaled, slowly, painfully dying. Eventually, it was under the leadership of Alexander that the crossbar was included with the pole, and it went from impaling to crucifying. By the days of the Romans who crucified Jesus, they had perfected this as a torturous art form. When men were crucified, it was often at eye level so their enemies could see them, curse at them, mock them, jeer them, place bets for the time of their death. In addition, this allowed wild animals to feast upon their still living flesh. The history outside of the Bible records that men could hang upwards of nine days on a cross. Well, as their blood drips, it draws animals, and those animals are vicious. In addition, occasionally a woman was crucified, rarely, but occasionally. On those occasions, they would turn the woman around because even those barbarous people didn't wanna see the face of a dying woman. Well, before Jesus died, a few things happened. First, he was crushed. He was forced to carry his uh, crossbar, but before that, he was scourged. Let me explain these in succession. The Bible simply says that they took Jesus and had him scourged. That's all it says. The people who heard that didn't need it explained because once you saw it, you never forgot it. The way that ancient scourging would occur, uh, the soldiers would take a criminal, convicted and condemned. They would beat the man, oftentimes prior to his scourging, which is what they did to Jesus during a sleepless night. The soldiers would then strip that man nearly naked. They would affix his arms above his head, oftentimes over a large stone or boulder to keep him upright so that they could expose his shoulders and his back and his buttocks. And then a Roman soldier would stand one on each side and they would whip him with a flag room, also called a cat of nine tails. It had a handle, it had straps of leather. At the end, it had metal balls. And sometimes they were stoned. The purpose was to tenderize the flesh. 
so that then the hooks made out of metal or sometimes bone could sink deeply into the man's flesh. They would take turns whipping the man. This would cause deep tissue trauma. This would traumatize the deep and vital organs. This would cause significant blood loss. They would then rip the man's flesh off of his body. Many men died from the flogging or the scourging. Some medical experts who have examined this, including the American Medical Association, have declared that this would be the equivalent of a shotgun blast to a bare back at a close range. He was scourged. Upon that bloodied barren back was then laid the crossbar. History outside of the Bible, I'm reminded, there are occasions where when they would flog a man and tear the flagrum from his body, a rib would come flying off his body. The prophet Isaiah anticipated 700 years prior that he would quote, be marred beyond human likeness. Upon that barren bloodied back was laid a cross of upwards of 100 pounds. So now Jesus is forced to carry it through the narrow city streets of the ancient walled city of Jerusalem while women and children are horrified to see this man. He goes from scourging to crushing. He then trips and falls. Those who have examined this would say that the weight of that crossbar on his chest as he fell to the ground would be the equivalent to a head-on car crash where you at high speed had a head-on collision with another vehicle, you had no seatbelt or airbag, and you were thrust and thrown into the steering wheel. Now he has heart contusion. Now he is looking at an aneurysm. Now he is needing medical attention because death is looming. And then they took him to the place of crucifixion as Simon of Cyrene helped him carry his cross. And Jesus, who was a carpenter and driven many nails, they then took nails the size of railroad spikes, five to seven inches, drove them through the most sensitive nerve centers on the human body, the hands and the feet. Jesus' cross and crossbar were then lifted up, dropped into the hole, and his body is shaking violently, uncontrollably, as the nerve sensations are deadening. We're not good people. And the cross of Jesus shows how evil the human heart is. While Jesus is hanging, he says a few words. Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. He's praying for them and he's praying for us. He's praying for his murderers. Then he says, I am thirsty. They take a sponge and they shove it in his mouth. In the ancient world, the sponge was part of the field kit for a Roman soldier. When you would go off into battle, you needed to go to the bathroom and relieve yourself. You needed a way to cleanse yourself. So they would give you a sea sponge. You would then get a stick. You would affix it, that sponge to the end of the stick. You would sop it in wine vinegar as a disinfectant. And then you would use it to scrub yourself after a bowel movement. Hearing about Jesus loving and praying for people, a soldier takes his sponge and shoves it in Jesus' mouth. That means that the remaining words that he says from the cross before he dies, he does so with the taste of a soldier's bowel movement in his mouth. He then says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He quotes Psalm 22, one. In that moment, Jesus took our place and died as our substitute for our sin. He then says in a loud voice, it is finished. And Jesus pays the price for our sin and he dies the debt that we should pay. And then lastly, he says, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And he breathes his last. To ensure that he is dead, a Roman soldier then takes a spear, pushes it, punctures it through his side under his rib cage so that the spear punctures his heart sack and water and blood flow from his side. Jesus literally spiritually dies of a broken heart. He is then wrapped in upwards of 100 pounds of burial linens and spices. His body is wrapped in a near mummified state. He is placed in a tomb that belongs to Joseph of Arimathea, a well-known public man, a place that was easy to find. The Roman government put a seal over that tomb. In addition, they affixed it with a seal that it was now government property and they positioned soldiers in front of it to ensure that the dead body was not compromised. And Jesus lay there for three days. He then rose from death on a Sunday. He rolled that stone away and he walked into town. 
And he appeared to crowds upwards of 500 at a time over the course of 40 days. His own family saw him risen from death and his own enemies saw him risen from death. We'll talk about that more on Easter. He then ascended back into heaven. And as he went, the angels who were present because the unseen realm was involved, they said, the same Jesus who has gone up, he will come down. We are now awaiting the last war. Make no mistake, at the cross of Jesus Christ, there was a war waged between the seen and the unseen realm for you and for me. And right now, Jesus is alive and well, and we are awaiting and he is preparing for his second coming. This will be the final war, the war to end all wars. When Jesus returns, there will be two options. You will continue to live as an enemy combatant against God and an enemy of God sided with Satan. If that is you and you do not turn from your sin and trust in Jesus Christ, you are living a life of a declaration of war against God. And God is going to return and he is gonna defeat and destroy you. I just need to warn you. My job is to tell you the truth. Your job is to make a decision. The Bible tells us about this fact. I'll give you two scriptures. Jesus says this in Matthew. He says, it says, then Jesus will say, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Make no mistake, this same Jesus and his angels who won the war in heaven, though Adam lost the war on earth, Jesus will win the war once and for all for earth. Now you need to know that right now, the Holy Spirit reminds me, the Bible says that Satan is quote, the God of this world. That's why the world feels like hell. It's ruled by the prince of darkness. When Jesus returns, the prince of darkness, who is currently the God of this world, he will be judged and condemned along with demons and unbelievers, and they will be sentenced to hell, which was created for the devil and his angels. You don't need to go there. God did something amazing for you and me at the cross of Jesus Christ. He substituted, he substituted himself for human beings, but not demonic beings. Zero demons can be saved. Some would say, I don't know how a loving God could send people to hell. I struggle to know how a righteous God could bring people to heaven. If all demons who rebelled go to hell and some humans who also rebelled go to heaven, we call that grace. You deserve hell. I deserve hell. We deserve hell. I'm no better than you. In fact, most of you are probably better than me, but we're not perfect and God's standard is perfect. And Jesus said, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And we've all fallen short of that standard. And the Bible calls that sin. What it will look like if you don't receive Jesus and you reject his offer of salvation, you continue to align yourself in this cosmic battle against God. Then ultimately when Jesus returns and he defeats Satan and demons, he will then judge and destroy you along with them. I'm gonna now give you one of the most haunting scriptures in the entire Bible. It's in Revelation 14, verses 10 through 11. Here is a portrait of hell. This is the future. P Revelation is the book of prophecy. It tells us what is to come. I pray this is not you, but this is your decision, my friend. He also will drink of the wine of God's wrath. We talk a lot about the love of God. God is love. He's only love for his children. He's wrath for his enemies. The Bible speaks of the wrath of God. I'm reminded over 600 times in the Old Testament with some 20 different words. The wrath of God is connected to the holiness of God. The holiness of God is the most common attribute of God mentioned in the whole Bible. God is holy. He poured out his wrath on the cross. If you believe in Jesus, he loves you. If you reject Jesus, his wrath remains upon you. Poured full strength into the cup of his anger and he will be tormented, that's, that's hell. With fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels, this is the unseen realm, and the presence of, what does it say? The lamb. And the smoke of their torment, this is hell, goes up forever and ever. You're an eternal being, you have a soul. It will go to heaven or hell forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Let me just say this. Jesus Christ is the Lord of hell and heaven. Jesus is Lord over all, or Jesus is not Lord at all. When all is said and done, Satan and demons do not rule hell. Jesus rules Satan and demons, and Jesus rules hell. 
you will be with Jesus forever as friend or foe. The Bible says in Philippians 2, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, both on the earth and under the earth, to the glory of God the Father. You will bend your knee now or then. You will bend it now for salvation or then for damnation. The other option is that if you turn from sin and trust in Jesus, if you accept his defeat and victory at the cross, it looks like a defeat to the unseen realm, but it's a victory to the children of God, then you will not go to hell, you will go to heaven. And when Jesus returns, you will not be with Satan and demons, but with men and women who are saved by God. I now wanna share with you, and I'm a little long for time, but I don't wanna rush. I wanna share with you what I believe is one of the most deeply insightful revelatory scriptures regarding the unseen realm in the entire New Testament. I don't know if I have read this verse personally in my study once in the last 10 years without shedding tears. We're gonna look deeply under the unseen realm right now at the cross of Jesus Christ. Colossians 2, 13 through 15. You were dead, spiritually dead because of your sins. You can't blame anyone. And because of your sinful nature, you're a sinner by choice and nature, was not yet cut away. Then God, God made you alive with Christ. This is what he did on the cross, friend. He forgave all past, present, and future, all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. And here's the, here's the glimpse from the seen to the unseen realm. He disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities, Satan and demons. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Let me explain this to you. When Jesus was crucified in the unseen realm, there was a list, had your name on it, and it had all your sins on it. Every one of those was a deed claim from Satan. They belong to me. They've sided with me. They agree with me. You were guilty, condemned. By nature, children of wrath, enemies of God. And Jesus went to the cross and he died, not for his sin, but for your sin. And he died for that full record of debt that you and I owe to God. And it says that through him, Jesus was triumphing over the unseen realm and Satan and demons. Let me, let me explain this to you as I approach my conclusion. The original hearers would have understood something called uh, Roman triumph holidays. Well, what happened is when their king and kingdom would go off to war, if their king and kingdom were victorious, they would have a three-day celebration. They would call a national holiday. No work, no school. Everyone would wear white. They would come to the capital city of Rome. There was a highway that led to the fortified city. They would build bleachers so that multitudes could line the highway all the way into the city. The city was protected by gates at the end of the highway and the gates were open because there were no enemies and there was nothing to fear. The people would wear white, symbol of peace. There would be feasting and celebrating and music. There would be a three-day parade. The first day, everyone would gather. And the first procession were the soldiers. The men who had gone to war the men who had defeated the enemy, the men who didn't surrender. And the people would cheer and celebrate and honor them. And the wives would come and kiss their husbands and the children would celebrate their fathers. And it was a day of celebration. And then anticipation would build. And on the second day, the generals would bring the plunder. Here's all the gold and the artwork and the silver and at the end of the procession were all the oxen that were gonna be slaughtered to feed all the people. 
and the bounty was distributed to the people and now they were rewarded and they were blessed. And then the oxen were slaughtered and people feasted and there was celebrating and anticipation built. And then the third day, the procession would start with the prisoners of war, the enemy combatants that had declared war against their God. Following them were the generals for the enemy nation, bound and gagged and mocked, disrobed and disarmed. The enemy king was then paraded near the end. And last, last came the king, the king of kings riding in victory while the people cheered and shouted. They were so glad that he was their king and finally he had secured their kingdom. I was praying for you this week. Here's what God showed me. Jesus died on the cross and for three days, Satan and demons thought they were having a triumph party. Finally, we lost the war in heaven, but we lost, we won the war on earth rather against Adam. And finally, we've won the war against Jesus. Finally, they were celebrating and feasting. And three days later, our king rose. And Satan and demons have no concept of a king who would love his citizens so much that he would sacrifice himself and die for them. Jesus is coming again. There's one more war. It's called the war of Armageddon. Let me tell you what's gonna happen next. The Bible is 25% prophecy. There's a few remaining. God's proven himself true to his word and that will be the case forever and ever. There is a day coming when the nations will surround Israel and that will indicate the coming war, the final war, the battle of Armageddon. We might even be in that moment as there is war in Israel for the first time in 50 years. When it seems like all hope is lost, Jesus Christ is going to descend from heaven. He's going to ride into history on a white horse and his name is faithful and true. He'll be wearing white to bring peace. Jesus will come and he will declare war with a sword from his mouth, which is the word of God. It says in Thessalonians that he will destroy Satan, demons and enemies with the breath of his mouth. This is no fair fight. The new Jerusalem will descend Heaven and earth will come together. The seen and the unseen realm will be reunited. The book of life will be opened and the dead will rise. You will rise. You will rise from the dead just as Jesus rose from the dead. That book will be opened if your name is not in it because you do not believe in and belong to Jesus you will go before the judgment seat of Christ with Satan and demons. You will go to hell and you will suffer forever and ever. You have no one to blame but you. Jesus died for you. You don't need to die for you. I am begging you, I am pleading you, trust in Jesus Christ. He's the only hope we have and he's the only hope we need. And then, Then those of us who are his children, the Bible says we'll all be wearing white, showing peace and purity because of the cross of Christ. The gates will be open. We're all going to be singing and celebrating and shouting Perhaps on the first day will come all the martyrs, all the saints who have died preaching and proclaiming the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Perhaps with them will be those sacrificed in the abortion Holocaust, rescued by the Father heart of God. And we as children, we're going to, we're going to celebrate the victory of life over death. Perhaps on the second day, all the, 
All the plundered wealth of the nations will be given to the children of God as our rewards. You're gonna see your family members who love Jesus. By faith, I believe you're gonna see your child that you miscarried. You're gonna be a perfect version of yourself. You'll never fear again. The curse will be lifted. Sin will be no more. Death will be gone. Demons will be vanquished. And Jesus will rule and reign. And in the end, I hope you're there that day, friend. I love you so much. My volume is not anger, it's, it's concern. It truly is. At the very end, we're gonna see King Jesus and he's gonna be in victory and triumph and glory. And he's going to be ushering in a kingdom that never ends. And I don't know if we're going to be in the last seat at the end. I just wanna be there. I just want you to be there. I just wanna see Jesus and I just want you to see Jesus. <laughs> and everything's gonna make sense. And as it hits us, we're gonna start weeping. And then the Bible says, he's gonna take his nail scarred hands and he's gonna wipe the tears from our eyes and we'll never weep again. We're gonna take communion. This is your time to meet with God. I went too long. We remember the broken body and shed blood of Jesus. Just gonna close us here. This is where the Holy Spirit is appointed for us to stop. If you don't know Jesus, this is where you tell him, I'm a sinner and I'm sorry, and you're a savior and I say thank you. And you take communion remembering his broken body and shed blood. This is where you repent of your sin. If you're a Christian, if you're a prodigal, you return home. We'll just spend a few moments and they're gonna sing over you as you partake and depart. Holy Spirit, thank you for an opportunity to teach your word. God, I love these people, but not like you do. Lord, I'm just a messenger, but you're a savior. And so I ask you to do your work right now in Jesus' name. Love you.